So, this is me, um, looking rather serious. Um, so as I said before, I'm the founder of Presspad. I also work for the BBC, um, currently for World TV as a producer, but I've um, filmed, pitched, produced um, many documentary in, in my time. Uh, and as I just said, move this down, um, I have uh, also done radio documentary. So this is pitching a radio or a TV doc. Uh, next. So how is pitching for TV and radio different to other pitches. Um, so I've got five kind of ideas here that we'll be looking into over the course of uh, this presentation. First one, um, for those of you maybe who are coming from a kind of more print background, it's the same, you know, we still got to say, you know, why is this a story? Why should we do it now? Why am I the person uh, to, to produce or present um, this particular documentary? But it's more of a commitment. So you have to think, is this really a documentary? Can it sustain, you know, five minute video or, you know, radio package, 15, 28, 57? Is it a documentary? Does it have a kind of epic beginning, middle and end um, to it as a story, you know, rather than being analytic? Uh, it's important to know if your, your story, your topic, and really it is a story, not a topic. That's why I mentioned the beginning, middle and end. Is it right for a documentary format? Secondly, not a 2D production, okay? So when ordinarily you'll pitch and yes, some of the style of your uh, pitches, you know, to magazines or, um, you know, online or print uh, publications, you know, may evoke some of the style of the way you're gonna write. It's really important when you're pitching for TV and radio to make sure that you are expressing um, what the audience is gonna see and hear, depending on which medium. Um, uh, so, that also leads um, to some other requirements, which are not obviously usual, uh, perhaps for other mediums, but we'll come to that in a bit. Um, number three, I'm calling this Go Blockbuster. So this is the notion that, again, thinking about that epic kind of story with a sort of, you know, the conflict, the jeopardy, the, you know, all the various kind of graphs of different emotion, um, documentaries uh, and, you know, documentaries for TV and radio are all about that. And sometimes it's helpful to think about your, story, idea, contributor, through the lens of, you know, Hollywood almost. So um, if you've got an idea and you want to say, pitch a documentary about, I don't know, let's think um, a farmer going through, you know, Brexit maybe. Sometimes it's helpful to think, okay, what are the kind of genres or, you know, maybe even fiction films are out there that might have the same kind of feel style that you have, you know, is there a character you know, in the world of cinema that you're looking for as your kind of ideal um, cast of characters, you know. Um, it's that sort of, sometimes you're doing a bit of casting essentially, and you're thinking in scenes and emotions and characters, um, perhaps a bit more than you might be in print. Uh, number four, I said they'll want a taste of what you're proposing. So this is a, a reference to something we call taster tapes or sizzle reels, um, as they're sometimes called as well. So more on that in a minute. Uh, number five, talent is key. So it's not what, but who, which is um, often said about many different areas of life. And this refers not just to who you're going to have in your documentary, uh, be that contributors, what we sometimes call characters, or who may be presenting your documentary, if it is presenter-led, because a lot of them aren't, a lot of them um, are what we call observational. Um, but it's also who are you pitching to? because there are many different places that you can pitch to, many different people. Uh, and it's really important as you would do if you're pitching an article to know your audience and your market. Uh, so we'll come to that as well. And then finally, how can pitching make it pay? So documentaries are difficult because they're a slightly longer, kind of bigger commitment, as I mentioned in the first point, and often take longer to, um, to fulfill really. So it's important to think you know, about funding. This is not about how to fund your documentaries. So that would be a whole other presentation. But I did want to stress that there are kind of quite clever ways, you know, some of which I have done with previous projects where you can make uh, your work pay either afterwards, which obviously needs a bit of a, you know, kind of cash injection before. Um, and I'll talk about that briefly. Um, but there are other ways that you can make sure um, that this long, long period, much longer perhaps than kind of bashing out you know, an opinion piece in an afternoon, which of course is still fantastic, um, you know, but you're, you're going to need 
be it kit, be it other team members, you're going to need to have um, more money to kind of go further. Um, and of course, budgets are bigger than, you know, when, when you're getting paid for the kind of print work. Um, but still, it's, it's a stretch sometimes. Right, so uh, what is a treatment or a proposal? So a lot of the time um, with pitching TV or radio docs, we don't call it pitching or a pitch. Um, often the pitch is, is involved and it's a much smaller sort of uh, summary of what you're proposing. But what broadcaster um, commissioners and editors will be looking for is a treatment or a proposal. So I started off by uh, just kind of laying out the rough sort of structure of both a TV doc treatment and a, uh, a radio doc treatment. So this is just very, very kind of um, general. You've got, you know, the overview of your story, the kind of elevator pitch, the thing that, you know, somebody might just kind of click on, read, and could be really what kind of, you know, makes it a yes or a no and allows them to kind of keep scrolling or keep reading. Um, and that's got to be short. So like, you know, our, our written pitches, which we want just to be 100 words, that should fit on the screen of an iPhone. Um, then you want to talk about, you know, who is involved in the team. Um, so your team, your talent, and also where you're aiming to pitch it. So are you um, aiming for a particular slot? What is the length? Which channel are you looking at? And, um, but in particular, there, there might be uh, for a documentary some larger, perhaps, almost, I guess, kind of subconscious, you know, subconscious to the story of what is happening. Um, are there kind of bigger themes that you're trying to get at? After that, you might want to give a couple of paragraphs of context. Um, so that's, you know, if you're pitching something about, I don't know, a, a school, um, a ballerina school in Kabul, you know, you probably want to give a bit of context about the war in Afghanistan, um, women's rights, you know, if it's mainly female ballerinas, etc. After that, as I said, oh, sorry, I've skipped ahead. Uh, let's go back. After that, you want to um, pull out some scenes. So these could be just a few kind of example scenes. And this is really, as we said before, you're trying to kind of paint what the audience and, and the commissioner is going to see. Um, you might want to then pull out a few characters. Uh, and as I said before, thinking about that kind of Hollywood casting, what role in your storytelling are these characters fulfilling? Some of them you may already know, your entire documentary may be sort of structured around one particular incredible character. Others may be sort of fulfilling more of a function so that you can tell many different facets of the same, of, 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 of the story that you're looking at. Um, so it really depends on, you know, what your, your, your story, your topic is. Um, but those characters are really important because again, specificity, is crucial uh, and if if you know you you don't yet have particular um contributors in mind you need to be able to paint the likelihood of you being able to find somebody very specific um or of a certain sort of uh i guess mold if that makes sense so that's why i liken it again to that kind of um fictional casting where you know if you're an actress you might show up and it says you know um acting age, you know, 17 to 21, you know, sort of looks nervous, student type, you know, it, it's almost kind of that specific um, when you're trying to think of, of, of your contributors and how they fit into the larger, um, into the larger story. Um, again here, what will it look like? Now this is a paragraph perhaps that's more referring to the style, format, type of cameras perhaps you're using. Is there any archive that you want to bring uh, to bear, um, you know, can the commissioner or the editor see it? And then finally, probably you'll want to include a rough budget. Um, so that's because a lot of these documentaries, you know, take a much longer. They may, you know, involve additional costs. How big is your team? Do you need, you know, to purchase any equipment or do you already have that? Will you need fixes if it's abroad? You know, it's, um, it, it's a much longer sort of amount of time that you'll probably be spending reporting and you know on on location um uh for the story so a budget is helpful uh, and of course then again everything that we usually do when we pitch stories why now why you and can the editor or the commissioner really from your treatment feel that if they were to say there and then yes let's do this you'd be ready you know to hop in your car plane on your bike, whatever it may be, uh, and go and get started on it straight away. So similar idea here with the radio pitch. 
um, uh, you've got a slightly different format, um, uh, but you know the, the, the idea is the same. You want a working title and tagline. This is partly because uh, commissioners kind of want to see you know, the sort of uh, little blurb in the Radio Times. And sometimes you know, working out what that title and tagline is can really help focus uh, your, your thinking really and your branding and, and also how you're appealing to different audiences. So that's important. Um, again, length, are you pitching a series? Which slot and program is it for? You know, pitching something that might be, say for example, just keeping to BBC, what, what I know, you know, to Heart and Soul, um, which is a series, you know, on the World Service, um, radio documentaries about religion. Very different to say pitching a kind of standalone series for, I don't know, Radio 4 Extra for example, or even, you know, um, Newsbeat or Radio One, you know, documentaries, etc. cetera. Um, knowing your commissioner for that particular slot is really important. Um, there's actually, uh, as I said here, uh, many places will tell you what they want. There's actually quite a lot of help for, uh, you know, production companies or individuals when it comes to pitching, um, because pitching often happens in seasons. So stories will be pitched um, quite far in advance, obviously, because it takes time, you know, to, to produce um, and edit and, and get everything ready, unlike where you might pitch a story in the morning and it's in print or publication uh, on, or online rather in the afternoon, um, there's a much longer lead in time. Um, so a lot of the time commissioners will put out sort of, you know, advice on what in particular they're looking for for that pitching um, season uh, and it can be good to get to know individual commissioners, just like editors, um, because you'll develop ongoing relationships. And often that's sometimes what people find difficult, um, perhaps when they're new to this, is that there are a lot of incredibly um, established relationships between top indie production companies and commissioners. And sometimes it's hard for newbies to kind of, um, to muscle in, um, but definitely not impossible. Uh, after that, you want to have a program description, one or two sentences, as you would tell someone kind of down the pub, um, what is this, you know, documentary about? A rough cost per episode. Um, you want your talent bio, so that's your producers as well as your presenters. A short synopsis, just 150 words, and then you can go into a bit more detail um, on episodes or give a sort of breakdown of different scenes uh, of your, your main documentary. Um, so this has got a hyperlink here, um, which I don't know if I click on it, it will pop up. Yes, it will. Um, and this shows you some of that guidance I was saying for back, I think it was in 2018 to 2019, is the World Service uh, invitations to bid uh, for documentaries. So you'll see here, they uh, actually, they break it down into how much budget you can get, what the length of uh, the various documentaries are, this is for radio, uh, how many of them they are needing to commission, um, in those uh, particular strands. And then as you go down, that's some, uh, some information about World Service English as a channel. Uh, and here you get some very specific details. For example, here the slot, the commissioner, uh, the duration, when it goes out in the week. And again, here, descriptions uh, of what, what they're trying to achieve with this, you know, content format and style. So here you've got one for pretty much every single program there is going. Uh, here, Heart and Soul, that was the one I mentioned. Um, so here, what they're trying to achieve, the listener gains knowledge and understanding of the way different people practice their faith around the world. It gives background and context to stories in the news, it may have spiritual or religious component, uh, et cetera. And then here, so a bit more about the style. So these sort of documents do exist um, and they are on um, the commissioning website of the BBC. Uh, and I'm sure if there are places that you want to pitch, perhaps, you know, Amazon, I know, is doing more um, audio, uh, you know, content, um, ITV and ITN, Channel 4, uh, Commission Documentaries, Vice, you know, if there is something, uh, any guidance you want, just get in touch. Um, because again, it's, it's a much bigger undertaking to put together a treatment or a proposal than it is to send off on a hundred word um, pitch for an article. So, uh, moving on, here, uh, that taste I was telling you before, the taste of tape or the sizzle reel. Um, personally, I find it's a bit of a catch-22, uh, and we will look at that. Um, but it is very important. So here, Charlotte Moore uh, quoted as saying, 
nothing will get your idea to the top of the pile better than a great taster. I can't tell you, <laughs> exclamation. Uh, it's so much easier to see something and tell if there's something in it. So this kind of creates a bit of a catch-22, especially I think for TV documentaries, because it's sort of like, well, they want to see something, but then they haven't commissioned me yet. So wait, like that doesn't make sense. Um, there are various ways of getting around it. Uh, having a very picture rich proposal, and I'll show you an example of one of those once I've got to the end of uh, this list. That is helpful because although some of those images are just stock images that you can get from Getty, you know, or, or on the internet, it does help kind of the commissioner sort of see the type of images um, that uh, they might be, you know, when you find your more specific uh, contributors uh, that will be in your documentary. Using pre existing archive is another option. So you know, whether it's being clever with uh, you know, content that's already out there, either news coverage, uh, putting some voiceover, whatever it may be. Um, if you have key contributors already lined up, then you can possibly do, you know, a very kind of tight uh, taster tape where you just do one beautiful interview with one um, person and then you kind of cover it with either B-roll and that's some, um, I guess, kind of general shots perhaps of you know, the environment that you're filming them in or archive, et cetera. Um, you can use sort of uh, blank title cards to fill in the gaps and tell the story uh, if you need to, to kind of move the story on. Um, you can also, you know, if you have an afternoon and, and your contributor or, or somebody who you know, could be a contributor or who is exemplary of the type of contributor that you might want, um, you can you know, just go pop around to theirs and film them doing something, asking them questions. It's a bit more dynamic, perhaps, in that sit-down interview. Um, you can also, if you don't have anything at all, um, but your documentary hinges or rests quite heavily on perhaps some key talent, if that person has already done something or is in the public eye in some way, or they've got a TED talk or whatever, uh, you can send them clips of that. Um, it's not really a taste of tape, um, but you could include and edit some of that together because then it just gives a sense of the personality of the person that you're, you're suggesting will present this. Um, these, you know, taste of tapes are only really a minute. They're really, really short, but the idea is to kind of get a sense of the style. So there are some things that, you know, may seem almost kind of moot points and totally irrelevant but then actually make a big um a big difference with whoever's on the receiving end of your taste to tape things like music for example graphics um all of that tone of narration even if you're just narrating it yourself um you know to to save money no no need to get a professional to do it just for a taste to tape but all of those the way they're done can really tell the commissioner ah, okay they're making this story but they're making this story for my channel, right? You can do uh, a documentary. So for example, uh, one of the films I did uh, for the BBC, which I'm gonna uh, come to a little further on in the, in the presentation, um, was about a transgender couple who gave birth naturally in Ecuador. And uh, I did the film for BBC Our World, um, but also TLC, um, which I'm trying to remember which network it's on. It's, you guys might know it. It's, um, I don't want to say trashy because, but it's a, you know, it's a lifestyle sort of, um, you know, almost slightly tabloidy um, American program. And actually they just got in with a couple before I arrived. Um, but their story was totally different. They were filming the kind of last days of the pregnancy and the birth. And my film ended up, you know, at first I thought, oh God, that's a really kind of, you know, sorry, the wordings, <laughs> this word's probably not the best word to use in relation to a pregnancy, but you know, that's the juicy stuff. That's the really kind of exciting things. But actually, when I realized, you know, I'm doing this in a much more sort of thoughtful way, looking at uh, how, you know, these two people who never thought that they would even get the opportunity to become parents are navigating parenthood. Um, so I think it's important to know, you know, if I'm putting a, a taste tape together for TLC, it would be completely different in style for something like Our World um, on the BBC. And finally, you can get around this by essentially not getting around it and just get funding and go for a recce. You know, if your subject is uh, very close to home, that's not really gonna be difficult. But, you know, if you are doing international stories like I have, that can involve, you know, some money and funding up front. Um, so yeah, that is something that probably you won't have come across if you haven't ever thought about pitching 
um, to, to, you know, to, to TV and, and with documentary. Um, this is a video um, which I'm going to play and this just shows, I'm going to just sort of fast forward through it and excuse the very kind of all white male panel, but this is from um, Sheffield Doc First, I think in 2013, I uh, just found it on the internet this afternoon. Um, and what this does is it shows you actually some of these taster tapes. And of course, as I said, you know, this is now seven years old, so it looks prehistoric. But um, the first one that I'll um, kind of uh, fast forward to shows a great use of kind of archive or sort of its webcam footage, really. So that's almost UGC, user generated content. Um, and then just good use of music and some title cards. So we'll look at this one first. So let me just. Mm -hmm. That's the channel because if they don't, it's a pain in the backside. Guilty pleasure to watch. From where we commissioned um, a, a two-parter um, last year that went here. Right. So let me just. <laughs> given a health warning on the language there but as you can see basically this is a really simple taste of tape it's just um those black title cards with a whole load of UGC um of you know those um Z yeah, gopros on on cyclist uh, heads from accidents and this is essentially being billed as a kind of you know drivers versus cyclists um kind of documentary a little bit bizarre I think but um, again it was 2013. Uh, this one is maybe a little bit more uh, traditional uh, so let's kind of fella or sometimes a female you know possibly slightly overweight sometimes other times mm -hmm. not they'll be in a fairly identical kitchen uh, they may have a specialism which is that they like to use particularly now this is talking use, about uh, a taste of tape for uh, a cooking program a cooking documentary uh, and he's talking about talent so how can you if you've got a particular presenter or a contributor really central to your documentary how can you show in a taste to tape what they're about i'm from croydon and i moved to paris five years ago when i was a kid i didn't eat much french food it was hard to meet people at the beginning when you don't speak any French. The hardest people to cook for are chefs. They're really difficult, especially if they're French chefs. When I say I cook professionally, they, they don't they don't believe that I cook professionally. They say like you're English, you can't cook. But then when I explain to them that I've trained in Paris, that I studied at a culinary school, I studied French patisserie, then they soften up because it's French patisserie. One of the first things uh, we learned to make at culinary school was how to make uh, tart pastry. This is like, I made it myself. It's just like some, uh, like a little kind of drawers with a chopping board on top. But you do what you have to do to make your kitchen work. Right. So that's enough of that. Um, essentially, uh, that is just to show you that with really just kind of something very small, you can evoke a sense of uh, style or atmosphere and you can get across quite a lot about, you know, there you are sort of quite a kind of, the, the um, commissioners afterwards talk about how you've got this sort of very cute kind of almost Amelie looking English girl who came to Paris to try and kind of um, you know become a chef um, and is up against all these sort of cultural uh, I guess um, uh, stereotypes that the British can't cook and you know something unless it's French uh, it's not good um, 
And so, you know, that was put together and immediately, you know, the, the editors and commissioners knew what that um, film was going to be about. So, um, who can you pitch and how? So if you've got your treatment, uh, which I whizzed through and I expect there to be tons of questions on that because I know I went quite quickly through that. Um, and you've, you've got your kind of, um, your taster tape or your scissor reel and the equivalent for radio would be, you know, some kind of recording, um, you know, clips, perhaps other previous work. Um, it's a lot less hassle, obviously, because you could do that just from the kind of comfort of your, your living room. And of course now with Zoom and recording Zoom conversations, Skype, um, it's possible to record the other end of somebody's uh, line. Um, so once you've got all of that, who can you pitch and how should you pitch? Uh, so possible places to pitch. So you've got the broadcasters, that's people like BBC, Channel 4, ITV, London Live, Al Jazeera. Uh, and I've put some kind of, I guess, sort of pros and cons of different places um, that you can pitch. So the broadcasters are good because they have guidance, um, as I uh, just showed you previously, and they've got even more guidance and videos from commissioners online saying, you know, this is how you should pitch us and these are the things that we want. Um, and they also have set slots, which are quite um, often quite set in stone or, you know, the, the particular strands have been going for years. And that can be good because that means that, you know, you're not constantly having to adapt to you know, perhaps different formats, uh, you can kind of set your eyes, okay, I want, you know, I want to do um, a heart and soul documentary and, you know, I, I can listen back to a whole load of different episodes and I know what it's about. That can also be a negative because um, if they have set slots, maybe they have set expectations and what you're trying to pitch is a little bit kind of out of the box. Um, but that's one thing. Um, the negative, I guess, to the big uh, kind of big broadcasters is that some of them only take pictures from established production companies. And as I mentioned previously, there's quite a lot of, um, you know, relationships that have been developed over decades uh, between some of those uh, production companies and producers and some of the commissioners. Um, but that doesn't stop you going to indie companies. So I've put here just a couple of examples of, you know, some of the um, independent production companies um, that I keep an eye on, October Films, uh, True North, but you know, there are so many out there. And if you have never thought, actually, the BBC doesn't create everything that goes out on its, um, on its, uh, on its network, um, you need to wait to the end of a program you like, go all the way down, keep watching all the way down to the end of the credits and look for the logo and the name of the independent production company. So for audio, Whistledown Productions is a big one um, because often, you know, the BBC does have a lot of, uh, current affairs and documentaries that they produce in-house, but a lot of it also goes out to that independent market. Um, same with Channel 4, um, Unreported World, if anyone here is a fan of that. All of those are made by Quicksilver um, Media, which is based in, in Oxford. Um, so here, kind of the, the pros of indie companies, uh, you can take your idea and work as a producer or talent to the said production company. You don't have to go straight to the top, you know, to the, to the broadcasters. So that's perhaps a little less intimidating. Um, but, you know, and again, not everyone will do this, but, you know, I think probably most of us as journalists have perhaps had, you know, perhaps sources or ideas that we feel maybe have um, gone walkies and someone else has ended up doing it or a staff writer or whatever. Make sure of a peace of mind that, you know, if you have particular sources, uh, and it's sometimes easier when you have a story with a very specific, um, uh, you know, contributor or sort of you know, character at the center of it, um, but make sure that you're the only person that can tell that story. So if you're a presenter, you know, why are you better than a more established presenter, you know, um, like Stacey Dooley, that they could just kind of helicopter in and do it instead. Um, websites, there's loads of websites now that do video and audio, you know, podcasts, um, all sorts of stuff, The Guardian, Thomson Reuters Foundation. Um, so that really opens up the market. Budgets may not be as big as, you know, we saw um, on that PDF before for the, for the radio docs. Um, and so they're probably best suited to someone who can kind of one man or one woman band it, um, because otherwise you're going to be splitting, you know, um, that, that fee with a lot of different people. And a lot of documentaries do need a team. So that's something to bear in mind. Grants, you can pitch directly for grants. Um, a lot of grants, for example, One World Media, which enabled me to make my our world film um, in Ecuador. That was essentially an application. They gave us a thousand pounds. 
sounds mad, but actually <laughs> that went quite a long way. And that gave me at least the impetus and some cash, as I said, to create something immediately. And there was also mentoring support there. The downside of that is um, you could spend a lot of time making a film and it might just live on your, you know, website or on your Vimeo. But I think, you know, overall, if you can get somebody to give you some money up front, um, even just to have the experience, you know, it's really, really worthwhile. And I definitely um, would wholeheartedly endorse One Mob Media. Um, there are a few other places that do things like this, but they are few and far between. And again, if we were doing a whole uh, presentation on how to fund uh, documentaries, we could go into more depth, but we're not. <laughs> Thank goodness, because um, I've got a lot of different uh, links to that, but um, that's a whole other kettle of fish. Finally, festivals. Uh, we've got sort of things like Sheffield Doc Fest, Open City Doc Fest here in London, um, festivals all over the world. And pitching to festivals or submitting to festivals can be really good because you can kind of do it just on your own. Um, sometimes it's overwhelming if you've you know, if you are quite ambitious about the different places you want to put your, your work, there are also um, some of the more, I guess, well-known festivals do have fees. So it can kind of rack up. You don't realize, you know, it's sort of like your Amazon basket, you know, by the time you sort of, I don't know, applied to 15 festivals or whatever, because, you know, there is also a numbers game some, sometimes to it. Um, you're like, oh my goodness, how did I spend that much? Um, so that's one thing to bear in mind. Um, but you um, can extend the reach of your documentary, you know, sort of globally, really, and the life of the doc is extended. So, you know, when I had uh, my film about Ecuador that went out on um, on the BBC, you know, it had, I think, maybe did get quite a lot of reruns and actually got rerun sort of um, over New Year. And I think originally it went out in May, kind of the year before. But overall, you know, maybe it'll be a kind of dozen of times that it'll be shown on TV with... Uh, the documentary and the festival circuit and there are also festivals um, like um, it's called Third Coast um, Radio Festival there are also festivals for radio but that can extend the life because you've basically got a whole year with you know festivals going on in all sorts of different places um, and for me it was important that the documentary this particular one was seen in South America and in Spain um, because you know that was the sort of cultural origins of the story. Uh, you don't have to do all the work yourself, so um, I'd be lying if I said that I undertook all of that um, whilst I had a full-time job. There is a great company, um, quick little plug for them, um, they don't know it and they didn't ask me to do this, but um, they're called Festival Formula and they're fantastic because what they can do is, you know, put together an entire spreadsheet, make sure you've got all the right assets and different formats to send to different you know festivals so i thoroughly recommend them if that's something you want to do um the downside is that you if you have given the rights uh, to a broadcaster uh, and this is usually you know um i think if you come with a sort of perhaps a semi-finished uh, piece of work then you uh, uh, you know, probably selling the rights to your piece. If you're commissioned, they'll probably own them up front because obviously, um, you know, they're, they're giving you all the money uh, and the resources often to, to, you know, produce that film or, or radio documentary. Um, but if you have sold it to them after the fact of making, you know, a first draft, which I did, um, then you need to make sure that your rights allow you to sell, uh, you know, either the same, ver oh, sorry, not sell, rather, um, put, uh, submit to festivals, either the same version or uh, a version that's slightly different because that, that can be written there in kind of the small print that you, can, you can't put it anywhere else. Um, so, um, as I said, uh, those are the people we can pitch. How do we pitch them? So before I told you, you've got this, you know, um, these various clips, uh, you've got your Sizzler kind of taster tape, you've got your treatment, um, which is, you know, kind of almost, you know, well, significantly bigger than your 100 word, 200 word uh, email pitch for a written piece of work. How should you approach, you know, kind of getting into that relationship? And I'd say, again, it's like normal pitching, email them first and don't give them everything up front. So I put treat them mean, keep them keen. So here you can see an actual email that I sent um, that led to, um, in the end, not a commission because uh, as you'll see, uh, that process can kind of get drawn out, but it did uh, end up with uh, two or three meetings with me, the talent in question, um, who was uh, a um, professor at Cambridge who I met when I was uh, reporting there for BBC Radio Cambridgeshire. Um, and this is just kind of a, an initial email. Um, I haven't sent them the whole kind of two, three, four page um, treatment, although I have 
and I chose, this was the way we chose to do it. I did work that up beforehand. You don't have to, you could wait and see, you know, do they, you know, do they bite? Do they, are they, do they seem interested? Do they respond? Um, but the way I've kind of structured this, um, you know, I've said hello. <laughs> I've sent the email to a few different people trying to work out, um, you know, perhaps who may be most interested. Um, uh, obviously, if you have a pre-existing relationship, you'll probably know if it's where it's the right fit for. In the first paragraph, I'm kind of selling my talent and I'm letting them check them out quickly. So I've put some links. I said, here, you can see him speaking here at the Cambridge Science Festival. Uh, I've then given a brief overview. I've said that's probably too long, um, but this is, you know, a six part series taking listeners through how digital technologies such as AI are transforming society, relationships and human experience. Um, so that's sort of, you know, the kind of, I guess, bulk of, you know, what is this about? What are the big questions? In the next paragraph, I sort of brought it to life and in brackets I put here, these are all the sexiest bits. So I've said some examples of the kind of scenes we'd like to include in the series. Chris getting a full AI medical diagnosis um, at one of the new NHS AI medical centers opening this year. Jamming with an AI musician in London, uh, those exist. Uh, interviewing Sophia the robot um, uh, about what it means to be uh, a person ahead of her surreality show in the States. Um, and testing himself and other legal experts against predicting the outcome of a legal case versus a robot judge in Estonia. So these are just kind of some of the bits that may catch their eyes, you know, um, and again, you know, it may be that they come back and say, you know what, we love this idea, um, but we just want you to, to do it with examples, you know, that you can find in the UK because, way we're in the middle of a pandemic and you can't get on a plane. So it's just really to get a sense that you understand you know, these are the most exciting things. You're kind of across the topic. Um, and these are things that would work really well and sound really good on radio, or if it's um, for, for TV would look great. Uh, and the final sort of or penultimate paragraph, I'm giving them a bit more information about what Chris is up to right now. That's to create a sense of urgency and importance. So it's so an important guy who's um, working with the, um, the RSA and has got all this stuff going on. You really want to get him in and, and chat to him sooner rather than later. Uh, and then finally, I'm telling them that I have that full synopsis if they want to know more and episode outlines um, and I'm giving them my phone number so that we can take things to the next level um, and make that easy for them. So, um, yeah, we've got my awesome GIF here. So the point of that email is then to kind of get in the room with them. Um, and if you can also get in the room there with your talent um, so that you can, you know, express all the passion and, you know, all of the kind of nuance, um, you know, that you've got in, in the room. And I think that's really important because, you know, it's, it's like anything really, as soon as you can get some face-to-face -face time or in these days, you know, um, kind of phone to phone time, it's, it's showing that your, your commissioner is getting more and more invested in what you're doing and it's allowing them to kind of fall in love a bit with, you know, your presenter, you, your idea, the way you do things. Um, so that's what you're kind of aiming for. Um, so at that point, then you would hope that they would say, okay, brilliant, send over your full, um, your full treatment, awesome, we'll keep in touch, which takes some time, you know, to keep these busy people, to keep going back. Um, but now you also need to realize that some of these questions may be sorted for you, but others may not. So pitching is only one aspect of, you know, the, the, the broader kind of preparatory work um, for getting a documentary production process starting. So here, not to overwhelm you, but just a quick kind of run through, you know, finding a team. It's really important that you can work in a team because as I said, these are bigger undertakings than, you know, um, uh, writing articles, although obviously articles, sometimes, you know, big New Yorker style pieces have fact checkers and assistants and all of that. Um, but often, you know, here, a good camera person or a producer or someone who can do something you can't do makes a world of difference. Um, as I said here, documentaries are often a team sport. That said, the radio documentary that I did recently um, was just me. Um, uh, uh, and that was kind of terrifying. Um, I was producing, recording, editing, presenting. I almost killed myself. <laughs> um, so yeah, it can, it can be done. Um, but you know, I think uh, most of the time, if you have people who are really experts at their craft and you can work together with people, it's just much more fun too. Um, you got to make sure you do your market research so you can have your whole pitch, you know, done. And this is probably, you know, should have been done beforehand. Um, but, you know, it's possible to pivot. So, as I've said, just because one place says no doesn't mean it's 
not any good, you know, pitch, 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 obviously tweak and make sure that, you know, what you're doing. Um, there are some, for example, places that if say the BBC didn't take the documentary on, you know, transgender parents, um, there are places, for example, like Al Jazeera's Witness, where probably I wouldn't pitch that story, seeing as, you know, um, Al Jazeera, you know, is, is um, based in Doha and perhaps that isn't a story that's going to interest uh, their commissioners or, or their viewers. I might be wrong, but you have to think about, you know, um, where it is that you're, you're pitching to um, and that, you know, should be done at the very beginning, but it can also, you know, be done periodically throughout um, and if you need to pivot and kind of pitch to somebody else because you've got a rejection elsewhere. And funding. So, um, Funding is difficult uh, and you have to get creative. Uh, if you're still a student, there may be pots of money in your university that you can kind of ransack um, and put towards documentary. Documentary is great because, you know, radio or TV, it's such a big, um, such a broad church really. So, you know, you can have anthropological documentaries, you can have, you know, kind of almost, um, uh, we can have factual documentaries, you can have, you know, almost kind of reality, mockumentary, you know, which is sort of comedy. So, where, you know, whatever it is you're looking to do, there is probably a pot of money somewhere hiding in some department that you can access. Um, so that's worth thinking about. If you don't have that and you're not a student anymore, um, there are funds, like I said, One World Media um, has a great fund. Um, sometimes you have to, if you can, see it as a bit of a... Uh, I guess an investment um, and you might need to put a little bit of money or time you know um, as unfortunately we all do before the pitch process but as I said this lead-in time is much longer so um, you know that is a great commitment that you may be doing without you know having been funded for that work and um, getting the story ready uh, to pitch um, but you if you put that in and you have your say takes to tape or your um, you've spent some time doing some pre-reporting um, that can that can be helpful even if um, you don't need money to do that you just need time um, and then another option is um, can you finance uh, what you're doing you know if it's say for example it's a story that you're interested in in another part of the world when we're allowed to travel again or another part of the UK when we're allowed to travel again um, uh, or even you know um, I don't know if say you're making a an online um, you know documentary about I don't know the dark web and you're filming everything you know through I don't know filming recording your screen I have no idea but is it possible to finance some of um, that documentary kind of time by maybe even doing smaller stories on the same topic as you go and kind of selling those um, to bring in a bit of money to then you know work with the same characters sources etc and build up something bigger um, so yeah those are a few considerations that are outside of the pitch process but are things that you know you're going to need to to bear in mind um, uh, yeah so I said multimedia is king um, this is sort of when you're pitching it's really important not just for you but sometimes even for your commissioners as I think you may not have seen it but in that documentary uh, sorry in that pdf from the world service radio on documentaries they had a whole section on their kind of digital output often they'll want to know you know what are the digital elements you know how will we kind of do little cut downs for instagram or you know how will this look on youtube etc um but even just for you as, as an individual you know producer director journalist um multimedia is your friend so you'll see here uh when i did um oh, sorry when i did uh, this documentary I've been talking to you about, um, you know, I had it uh, on from our own correspondent. I did a piece with a digital video for online. It came out as that 30 minute, 30 minute documentary and it also went on the festival circuit. So, you know, I was staff, so I didn't actually get paid for each of these, but if imagine you're a freelancer, um, you would get paid for each of, you know, the different kind of iterations of the story. Um, and, you know, there is potential, again, I can only work for the BBC, but if, if again you're a free agent you could do you know uh, an article for the guardian uh, but you could do the you know the digital documentary for vice whatever um so that's something that can kind of retrospectively earn you some money back because you know you have sold that story several times over and again that's you know you can do that with shorter stories you can do that with print you know print first stories but it's something I think to be even more aware of when you've got that long lead in time and you've got a bigger commitment um, 
you know, financially to getting your story done just because documentaries are a lot more uh, labor and time intensive. So a final reminder, just to come back um, to uh, those, those kind of points that I made and then we can take some questions. Um, uh, documentary pitching, it's same, same as all pitching, but more of a commitment. Is it really a documentary? Uh, ask yourself that before perhaps going through a lot of um, pain because it may just not be able to sustain the length of time um, that you know we need as a documentary and the kind of emotional arcs um, that are required. Are you talking about what you're seeing and hearing and really painting the picture um, for your, your commissioner? Are you thinking in scenes and characters and emotions and really taking the reader of your, your pitch, your treatment, on that emotional uh, journey. Have you got a taste to tape? Have you got a way around going out and filming a taste to tape? If you're not able to do that, can you put together, um, you know, it's not quite gonna cut it if you've just got a whole collage of images or a mood board or, you know, um, kind of PowerPoint note. It, it does need to look like a film um, and be professional, but can you find some ways of pulling in archive um, uh, footage or getting one amazing interview that you can then you know really stylistically work around um, who's your talent if you're going to have talent and your talent is not just you know the people that are on air or on screen it's also your um, your producers your directors those are also your talent and your your contributors can be your talent so if you think about that series I think they're running again at the moment on BBC um, looking at mental health so Rio Ferdinand, um, uh, Nadia from Bake Off, you know those um, those are your talents and I guess they're kind of because they're perhaps um, celebrities that are more in the media eye they're perhaps more media trained so they're kind of a contributor sort of um, you know present a hybrid but think also about you know if you're going to do an observational documentary about and I'm trying to think Agnes Varda, um, you know, the French um, uh, artist, you know, that is also important that you have access to that. Um, and, and that is a, a central part of, of what you're pitching and selling. And how can you make your pitching pay? So um, recycling your leftovers. So you've got this. No problemo. Um, next step, the Oscars. Uh, I'm Hoping to see all of your, your productions soon. Um, and I think we'll go to some questions now um, before we wrap up. So I'm just gonna uh, exit my screen sharing um, and see if I can say hello to you guys again. Yep, yeah, is that? So got a whole bunch of questions here. Um, let me, whew. So, let me start at the top. So is that document something they publish regularly and publicly? So I imagine uh, you're talking about the World Service Radio. I think it is, um, otherwise I'm not sure how I got hold of it, but I can come back to you on that um, in, in, in some of the notes um, and on social media afterwards. Um, uh, we're stuck in the middle of the COVID scenario and this hampers our ability to create documentaries in some ways. Do you have any advice on how to overcome some of the obstacles presented by COVID? Uh, so that's from April. Um, yeah, it's a tough one. I think radio is obviously easier uh, to do because actually, you know, almost, I don't know, everyone and his dog are making podcasts now. So um, that's a little easier. And, you know, you do have quite a lot of online resources, you know, music, um, libraries, all of that sort of stuff. Um, it is difficult. I don't think it's impossible. And I think, again, you just have to work on a smaller canvas. Um, you know, if it's something that you're pitching and you're getting commissioned, um, you know, journalists are some journalists are classed as key workers so it could be that whoever you're commissioning is able to kind of you know get you a pass to to go out and um and film um uh, i think you know sticking with what you know is often a very good thing you know when you're perhaps starting out in a new medium um so perhaps you know looking looking inwards at the more personal things or even you know if you don't have to get very, very close, you know, when you've got kind of a good lens and whatnot. Um, so, you know, it could be possible when you're going out on your, you know, walk or I don't know how quickly the lockdown is going to lift. Apparently now we can, we can meet with six different people uh, from Monday, you know, in an outdoor space. Um, so 
I think if you've got your, you know, your gloves, your mask, um, you're keeping it a good distance. Um, I think it should be possible still. Uh, it just depends, you know, I think very much will probably be limited to kind of UK centric. That said though, you know, you can as well, uh, if you take some time, um, set up some, you know, slightly better than average looking Skype interviews. Um, so, you know, that that's something else that's worth considering. Uh, Nicola, um, if the talent is someone like a professor, do they mind that they have to give up so much time for, uh, for helping get the pitch ready, including attending meetings, or are they always just as invested as you in the process? So, um, a lot of them are. Um, Chris, you know, was thinking about writing a book. Um, he was fascinated by the idea of making his research more relevant to, um, to the um, audience, his audience. Um, it's a little bit of ego always involved, um, you know, with everyone, I guess. So, you know, the idea of getting your own um, radio documentary program is appealing. Um, so, yeah, often as well, you've got to remember that, you know, things that are second nature to you, like how to, uh, I guess, sort of uh, shape a pitch, um, things like his subject, you know, he spends hours, days, you know, years on. So often, you know, they're, they're quite happy to, to um, sort of dive in and, and contribute because it won't take them particularly long. Um, just going to check uh, what my team are telling me on Slack to make sure I'm doing all of this right for you. Um, go to the next question just in the chat. Um, so I think we've got some questions that are coming as well over Facebook. Um, so, yeah, let's see if any of those are coming through. Um, from Mark, how do you find the email addresses of commissioners once your pitch is set to go? So there are some um, that, you know, are kind of generic, you know, um, BBC, you know, first name dot second name. Again, it's just like anything, um, a lot of their, their email addresses, um, some places have pitched portals, so they're asking you to put things through, you know, um, in quite a kind of structured way through a sort of portal. Those tend to be more for the, um, you know, indie production companies, which is why, you know, if you're finding that you can't connect with an individual commissioner or an editor, that it's better to go through those production companies. Um, but it's just like you would find any editor, you know, at the end of the day, if you know who it is um, that commissions things and often online, if you're kind of listening back to a radio documentary or again, looking at the credits, you'll see who the, the you know, executive producers um, uh, are, you know, the, the most important people are the people's names at the very end. Those are the people that will have commissioned um, that piece of work. So then take their name, call up through the switchboard and just say, you know, hi, um, if you can't work it out from the kind of generic format, um, you know, is it possible to speak to so-and-so? I just really like to chat to them about um, putting a pitch in and, and then just ask, you know, don't be afraid um, to just kind of go old school and pick up the phone. Um, so uh, I think Laura's added here for women, the IWMF funds short docs and doc ideas. That's true. Um, Mimi saying, hi, how would you recommend selling yourself as a presenter if you haven't got any documentary presenting experience? So yeah, that's, um, that's a good question. I think sometimes if you come with the idea and you come with the sources, um, you have a little bit more bargaining power. I think it's important to really, again, when we talk about casting, think about your own casting. So uh, I've got a, a friend who works at World TV um, uh, called Tiffany, who's an absolute badass. Um, she recently won um, a prize uh, for being, I think, best kind of newcomer as a documentary presenter. And she did something on, um, uh, I'm forgetting the term now. Um, Oh, what's it called when you're, you have um, an older man that pays for everything for you? Sugar babies, that's right. And she did a documentary about that phenomenon for BBC Three. And she's just way cooler and more street than I am. Like, there's no way I could have pulled that off. So I think it's important as well to realise, you know, what kind of channels or audiences would you speak to? Um, so, yeah, so we've got some more questions here from my team as well. Um, for something like a radio pitch, if you already make podcasts, can you pitch it as that? Do you still need a producer? Um, so you can pitch as a podcast. So there are different kind of podcast departments. You definitely don't have to pitch it as a documentary. Uh, I think the difference probably between a podcast and a documentary, a documentary is way more structured. So a podcast often has a format. It's quite chatty. 
you can have you know podcasts um that are also documentary series um so i think it just depends on exactly where you're looking to pitch as to whether there's an overlap there or not um so so that's something um worth thinking about but yeah i think it's way you know some of the the bbc content is being made into podcast you've got some kind of really long documentaries so for example i, I don't know if anyone um has listened to um i'm forgetting his surname now but jamie um his uh series the crypto um queen um the missing crypto queen um that was amazing and that was kind of almost like serial you know it was a sort of um true crime kind of you know in in different little episodes so that is a podcast um but it's not your kind of you know um i don't know traditional kind of chatty sit down you know sort of uh, what's been happening recently podcast if you think about louis theroux's new grounded podcast um you know that perhaps is a more traditional podcast where he's just kind of chatting with someone who's got a big name guest um so yeah they definitely uh they can be both um i just think it depends on exactly what you are pitching for uh, and to who so um uh let's see i think that's all the questions from the team but there are a few more still in here um Yep, so more, more people wanting to know about presenting. So yeah, as I said before, knowing your own, um, your own casting is really important. There are um, ways that you can, you know, get yourself on screen, um, you know, whether that's, um, you know, university kind of presenting um, documentaries, if you want to do, you know, if you do any kind of YouTube style stuff, it doesn't, you know, if you, if you give any talks, um, even if perhaps you do, um, you know, news reporting, although obviously depending on the topic and the outlet that you're kind of pitching to be a presenter, um, it is going to, it could be very different, you know, the formal style of TV reporters, it's almost as if the less personality of the better because you're trying to let the story kind of come through it's not about you um but obviously presenting you are that kind of um you know you're the you're the audience's friend you're holding their hand you're leading them through if we look at people like Stacey Dooley a lot I think now um presenters there's fewer and fewer I think kind of almost career presenters and way more influencers or you know celebrities that um producers you know kind of rope in because they've already got that following or they've got that kind of brand awareness um and sort of uh i guess you know potential um so yeah stacy dooley i think she was discovered um wasn't it through a, a sort of uh makeup um program some someone will know more than i do um you know but now she's you know doing sort of hard-hitting bbc3 docs on you know isis brides so you know it's it's not a kind of there isn't a one one kind of route into that and it is probably the hardest to control and the most perhaps competitive of areas but there are there are some companies that can put together showreels for you where they sort of you come up with some stories and they will um film you kind of topping and tailing doing your pieces to camera kind of uh, almost um mimicking you know um what it would be like if that piece had actually been commissioned and broadcast so that can get a kind of sense of the style um got a few more on here i haven't seen um a oh, question from slack um uh, which we've already covered can we still watch my full documentary online thanks nicola for your interest that warms my heart um uh, i can send you a link um because i don't think you can watch it anymore um i should just put the full thing on youtube um too many things on my to-do list um but yeah i'll make sure you get a link and I, I can put a link in some of the notes that will go out to everyone after this um from bear hutchinson how do we start off pitching and making the documentaries when we don't have professional level equipment okay so kids it's called an iphone this is an iphone se which is really embarrassing but i was kind of cool and lost my proper nice phone at a festival so but yeah even this um terribly old iphone uh can make broadcast quality um filming so there's a guy at the bbc um uh his name is now escaping me all names are escaping me um but he um he has been doing kind of mojo mobile journalism for ages um you know a selfie stick perhaps um you know there are some very nice kits um sort of um various different um what am i thinking of 
uh, Laura will know the, the term, um, you know, there are various different bits of kit that will allow you kind of to, to pan smoothly with your iPhone. But essentially, if you've got one of these, if you've got a smartphone of any sort, you can start making documentaries. Um, the sound is something that you know, often um, when you're being trained in documentary, professors again and again and again will say, um, you know, you need to, the sound is so important. Um, so you could just get a kind of separate sound recorder and possibly then sync up the sound if you're worried that the sound quality is not going to be as good. But, you know, these cameras now when a kind of, you know, on a top level iPhone or, um, or Android phone are incredible. So you really have no excuse, <laughs> just use your phone. Um, Let's keep going. I think there's a few more um, uh, here from Maddie. Are there permanent roles in independent audio production companies for people who have trained in journalism or are most people who pitch docs solo freelancers? There are absolutely um, permanent jobs in both audio production companies and indie TV production companies. Um, often when you've got seasons and you've got projects, um, you will have your kind of PDs. So that's uh, your producer directors those are usually the kind of um, they can be shooting PDs so that's a, a, produ a producer director who films um, your assistant producers your directors um, those kind of slightly higher level um, sorts tend to move as freelance from kind of project to project um, so they may kind of later on in life start their own production company and then kind of stick to the projects that they want to do but usually in the beginning that is a much more kind of, um, uh, I guess, yeah, project project by project role. But you've got your researchers, you've got your production coordinators, um, you've got your sort of exec producers, the people who are maintaining these relationships and kind of pitching to the commissioners, um, the heads of your your um, indie companies. Those are all uh, staff. So um, those are permanent roles. It can, in terms of career progression, you know, if you're interested in getting out in the field and filming going freelance can kind of get you there faster um, because you can ping around like a crazy thing to all these different um, roles as they come up. If you need that stability though, definitely um, you can work your way up from a researcher. Then you, you know, ask for more kind of um, responsibility, ask if you can assist and produce, ask if you can produce, et cetera, et cetera. So that's definitely possible um, in radio as well. And I think in radio probably actually um, there are probably more, permanent roles in those indies um, and that the people who come to those indies tend to be kind of journalist um, presenter types who perhaps will come with a story um, or who will be approached if the indie has a story and they want someone who's got a particularly good broadcast voice or perhaps um, already has a profile. Uh, so yeah, um, uh, ooh, Laura chiming in here um, with a link to help you find people's emails or email formats, which is great. Neve asking, how do you have the confidence in your pitch. Just because you think your pitch is good, it doesn't mean everyone else will. How do you not doubt your pitch and just go for it? So, um, plug for our pitch, um, <laughs> our pitch clinic. You can, um, you can send it to us and we can kind of have a look at it. Uh, you can also, it's really important that, you know, you have support networks, people who are informal mentors, um, peers who you can kind of, even actually, like friends not in journalism, that's often really good for, you know, work because something that someone who's I don't know just really into the news cycle or into current affairs might find interesting actually tv does tend to be a bit more populist um and there has to be you know I think it's partly because tv uh, radio is a little bit more cerebral tv a bit more um, emotional I think and so that's why you know we emphasize the kind of the scenes the narrative the emotion um uh so you know even just sending it to a friend and saying would you watch this um it is worthwhile um you know it's difficult having confidence just with anything any kind of pitch kind of putting yourself out there um but yeah i mean i think you know making sure that you do some of the basic things you know that you're proud of it um that there's no spelling or typos um you know that you're absolutely certain that the story hasn't been done this way before you know um i think some of those things can improve your confidence in sending the pitch um but ultimately you know it's a process. Um, if you don't do something that doesn't scare you, you're not going to grow. And um, what have you got to lose? So I think, you know, just sending it off, you know, sometimes I know freelancers who will give themselves, sorry, apologies, that's a notification. Um, sometimes I've, you know, I've got freelancers and myself, you know, when I was freelancing, um, 
I'd give myself deadlines of the number of uh, the number of pitches that I would send out. Um, sometimes it is just pushing yourself to do it um, because you never know. Um, and a pitch that sits in you know in Word on your computer or in your in your inbox uh, or outbox rather draft box even um, that's not going to you know that's that's definitely not going to get commissioned because no one else has seen it so um, I think that's what I'd say to that um, and I think also confidence comes you know when you start to accrue experience so you know um, the other thing as well is to see everything as a process so if it does get rejected what you're trying to do with any kind of pitch um, you know tv radio uh, or, or print um, written pieces is to develop a relationship so write back and say thank you so much for taking the time to get back to me because some people won't and of course then you've got to keep following up you know three four times minimum that's not pushy that's just standard um but if they do get back to you you know i had something actually that um didn't end up going ahead um and this was just me pitching a colleague within bbc and i said oh you know would you have any feedback and the person did write back and gave me sort of four or five bullet points and it was really helpful and sometimes the feedback is you know it's sometimes arbitrary you know i've had things rejected because well we already did an india film you know in the last year as if there's only one story in india right um but you know some of that is um arbitrary and may not make sense to you but even the arbitrary stuff that may feel kind of frustrating and unfair is useful to understand the mentality of you know a commissioner or the way their strand works you know if you're looking at pitching something and you've seen just i don't know two months ago somebody did a story that was you know similar or from the same place maybe try a different a different outlet that said though you know there could be something about it that they really love and 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 that just kind of overrides it there it's a definitely an art not a science um yeah that's it um follow us on on social um uh get in touch with us. It's just our first names at presspad.co.uk. If you want any one-on-one -on -one, uh, help, as Laura mentioned at the beginning, we've got our CV clinics on Mondays. We've got our pitch clinics uh, on Fridays. That includes pitches for documentaries, radio, digital video, um, print, whatever it is, we'll be here. And yeah, um, that's a wrap. Um, I'm sure we'll get more of the points from my, um, my uh, little presentation out to you on various forms, uh, Twitter, Facebook, Insta. So yeah, thank you for spending your evening with us and good luck guys.